Open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. And I'm sorry, I forgot you. Proverbs 6 tonight, a very, uh, I told my wife as we were praying, I said a niche subject, if you will, a very narrow subject here about something specific. Often we, uh, I'll get questions about things, practical things in life, and uh, and here's one of them that's going to be answered here in the Bible, Proverbs chapter 6, and you'll see what it is as we compare some scripture with scripture. Uh, may not be the most dynamic message, but it will be an instructive message, and I trust a practical message as well tonight. So Proverbs chapter 6, and as they're finishing up the handing out of those, uh, I'll give them a second, and then I'll begin reading here in a moment. Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 1, my son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, that's, that's like a handshake. You make an agreement, right? You, we say, okay, and you do that. That's the idea of that. So if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of thy friend, go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. We'll stop there because that's really where the paragraph stops. If you look uh, that up in the uh, Bible, on my Power Bible, you'll see that. And perhaps you have a Bible that's broken down in paragraph form. And that's where it ends. And then a new thought would begin with go to the ant. So what's he talking about here? And what's he saying here? And what is he telling his son about? Well, let's find out. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. I do ask as I preach the message that I... Believe you've led me to preach tonight, that you'd help me, Lord. We recognize without you we can do nothing. I cannot preach without thy blessing, without thy enablement. And so please help us. We cannot listen and apply things without your enablement either. So please rebuke and bind the devil. Remove any distractions from our minds and from this room tonight. And give us an understanding, a biblical understanding about this subject this evening. So I ask your help now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, right now, if you've been watching the news a little bit, and I don't suggest that you watch a lot of it, but uh, if you've been listening to some things, you'd, you know that being debated in the halls of our United States Congress is what is being called the Infrastructure Bill. The Infrastructure Bill. Now, the proponents of this 2,700-page bill. By the way, to give you an idea what that is, it's, you see the Bible in your hands that's in your lap right now? If it's a King James Bible, it's over 1,000 pages longer than that. One bill, okay? And they supposedly read it. They didn't read it. Anyway, I better move on, Okay. The proponents of this bill say that this bill is designed to rebuild and repair the infrastructure of our nation. Buildings, roads, bridges, power supplies, and the basic physical structures of our nation. They say it will do things like provide high-speed internet to all Americans. They say it will replace all lead water pipes in our nation. It will provide electric charging stations for vehicles. I mean, on and on it goes. And the liberals are hailing this bill as, quote, a generational opportunity. They're saying it is a bill that will, quote, I'm taking these quote, quotes right from their mouths, a bill that will change the game. They say, quote, it is the most, one, one, one uh, liberal said this, it is the most significant effort in my lifetime to invest in America's infrastructure. And the way he said it with his head shaking and the pride behind that statement was amazing. But what's interesting is that only 10% of this bill, 
270 pages actually deals with infrastructure. That's it. The rest of it, 2,430 pages, deals with a myriad of socialistic policies. Don't miss it. Things like $10 billion to create a, quote, civilian climate core. $20 billion to advance racial equity and environmental justice. $100 billion for new public schools and to make school lunches greener. <laughs> Billions of dollars to eliminate gender inequities. $25 billion for government child care programs and billions to provide immigration amnesty for millions of illegal immigrants. The total tally of this bill, and some of you know all this, so please humor me for a moment. The total tally of this bill will result in our government spending at least $3.5 trillion dollars. Now, while much of the content of the so-called infrastructure bill is quite repulsive in my opinion, that's another sermon perhaps, Amen. I'd like to ask a question about this bill that has kind of become a taboo question in our culture today. As a matter of fact, it's become a taboo question in some families today, and that is this. How are we going to pay for it? How are we going to pay for it. According to the Peter G. Peterson Foundation and every other source you can find online or anywhere else written, the United States of America, it, that's you by the way, that's us, Amen. is currently over $28 trillion in debt. Currently. $28 trillion. Now, to give you an idea of how much a trillion dollars is, I've I kind of have a few illustrations here, and maybe you'll get it after a few of them. A trillion is a thousand billion, or a million million. That's a lot. Right. Okay, let me try this one. A million seconds is 12 days. A billion seconds is 31 years. A trillion seconds is 31,688 years. If you made $50,000 a year, it would take you 20 million years to make a trillion dollars. Are we getting it now? A little bit? How much we're talking about? In order to spend a trillion dollars, you would have to spend a million dollars every single day for the next 2,800 years. And again, the United States is currently $28 trillion in debt before this bill is passed. Now, just to give you an idea of the snowball that's going on here, under President Reagan, the national debt crossed the one trillion threshold. Under George Bush, it passed the four trillion mark. Under Bill Clinton, it passed the 10 trillion mark. And under Barack Obama, he doubled the national debt, bringing it over 20 trillion dollars. What's going on here? Why is this happening? Why? You know, many will say that our national debt is caused by these factors. I thought this was interesting, too. They'll say it's caused by, well, one being the aging baby boom generation. You guys. That's me, by the way. I'm the tail end of that, right? You're the problem. Yeah, there's too many of you. That's the idea. They'll say also, attributing to that is rising health care costs. And they'll say a tax system that doesn't bring in enough money to pay for what the government has prom promised its citizens. I say, and uh, this is the best way I know how to put it at this moment, baloney. Yeah. Yeah. Baloney. Right. The reason for such a large national debt 
isn't hard to figure out. It's called math. It really is. We spend more than we have. Right. That was a tricky one, wasn't it? We're spending way more than we have. And, and, and the problem's not the intake, the problem's the outflow. And I'm not going to get into all the weird things we do with the money the government does, you know? But what's odd is that most Americans are indifferent to where we are. Why is that? Well, perhaps because there's an attitude or a philosophy that's prevalent in our culture today. And here it is. Our culture says, if I want it, I'm going to get it. That's right. And if I don't have the money to get it, I'm going to borrow it. And I'll pay it back sometime later. And if I can't borrow it, I'm going to find some other way to get it. But I'm getting it. That's the culture today. Because our culture says, as a whole, not everybody, as a whole, I want it and I want it now. And by the way, that philosophy will eventually cause you or a nation, a family, or anybody to financially implode. Right. You know, you'd think with everything that's going on, we'd be a little bit more cautious about things. Do you know in 2020, in 2020 we reached a new high for consumer debt? That's all about individuals, us, people. $14.8 trillion individuals. And by the way, many of God's people are guilty of this same philosophy. I want it, I'm getting it. No matter what, if I don't have the money, I'm going to borrow, I'm going to get it. Somehow, either guilty of the philosophy or part of it or some form of it. Why is that? You know, often it's because perhaps maybe we haven't been taught Bible principles about finances. Maybe nobody taught us. In other words, we don't know what the Bible says about finances. By the way, it says a lot about finances. Amen. Talk about this a little bit later. Or we don't see our mismanagement of finances as a problem or, or as a character flaw or as something wrong or as a violation of God's word. Or perhaps certainly we just don't care. Amen. Amen. But it is a problem. And we need, we need to understand and learn God's principles about finances, Amen. money. Amen. Now, for some time now, we've been looking at the subject, wisdom from above. It's a series I've been preaching through the book of Proverbs. The phrase, of course, is taken from James chapter 3 and verse 17, which reads, but the wisdom that is from above, God's wisdom, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So there is a wisdom that comes from God, and it's found in his word. The By the way, that same passage talks about a wisdom from beneath. Worldly wisdom, earthly wisdom, this idea of, well, we as human beings, we can figure this thing out. We don't need God. We don't need his word. We got this thing. Oh, yeah, we're doing real good. Let me tell you. We're doing real good at this thing without God. It's working out real good for us. And the idea of this is that this series is that God's people should not be living by the wisdom of the world. We shouldn't be looking at the world for our ideas uh, or the culture or everybody else is doing it. Uh, uh, we, we should live by God's wisdom, his word. Amen. And there is absolutely no better book in the Bible, in my opinion, to find more pithy, more pointed, Amen. and more practical wisdom, I mean, where the rubber meets the road, than the book of Proverbs. This is God's wisdom. Amen. And one of the areas that many parents fail in in training their children is the area of finances. The area of money, budgeting, buying, spending, making financial decisions. Do you know the Bible contains approximately 500 verses that directly uh, are, are on the subject of prayer? And about 500 verses that are directly on the subject of faith? But when talking about finances, there are 2,350 verses in the Bible on money and how we are to use it? Amen. But many times, oh, no, don't mess with that. That's my, that's, that's my personal area right there. Well, God wants to mess with it. Because he wants it to line up with his word. Hallelujah. 
You know, everything, think about this, everything that you and I do in life will somehow, some way, in some form involve money. Amen. It really will. It touches every aspect of our life. And our text this evening deals with a specific subject. There's going to be a lot of this stuff through the book of Proverbs. Here's probably the first one. And it's dealing with a very specific subject concerning money. It's the subject of surety. Look at that word, surety. Verse 1, my son, if thou be surety for thy friend. And so this morning, or this evening, whatever it is, today, amen, we're here. Amen. I'm going to preach on this subject, the wisdom of surety. Amen. In other words, what do I do with, what is it? What, what is, what exactly is surety? Is this something I should do? Is this something I should not do? How am I to handle this subject of surety? You say, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. I know, we're getting to that. That's what we're getting. We'll get there, okay? So let's look at that. Number one, would you write this down? Let's consider the definition of surety. So what is this saying? Notice verse one. My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger. Now notice again, we have a father speaking to his son. And he's trying to teach his son about being wise with his money. Amen. And he's talking about him being wise with his money in regards to suretyship. Now, the Bible spelling's an I. The modern spelling's a Y. So I went with the Bible spelling tonight. Amen? Amen. Now, the Bible speaks of this English word surety or suretyship in 15 different verses. We find 13 of them in the Old Testament. Two times we find the word surety or suretyship in the New Testament. Six of those 13 Old Testament passages are found in the book of Proverbs. So almost half of the subject of surety is dealt with in the book of Proverbs. Now there are two ways that the Bible uses this word surety. What is it? What does it mean? What's it talking about? Well, the first way is when someone is sure about something. That's the way we use it mostly today. At least I do. I'm sure about this. I'm confident about this. Uh, and that word is used in that way in four of those Old Testament verses, or four verses in the Bible. Genesis 15, 13. Genesis 18, 13. By the way, I've read all the verses on them to make sure I was preaching uh, this subject accurately uh, as best as I could. Genesis 26, 9. And Acts chapter 12 and verse 11. It's not a monumental feat. It's only 14. But anyway. Uh, let me read two of them. Genesis 15, 13. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety. Here's God speaking to Abraham. Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. So there it is, the word surety. Know for sure this. Know of a surety. Acts chapter 12 and verse 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod. So again, it means I know something for certain of a surety. That's not what we're talking about tonight. There's a second way that is used, and it's used in a financial context. Our text and ten other verses use it that way. We'll see some of them later. And here's what it means. To be surety for someone is written, I wrote it down on your sheet tonight, it means to obligate yourself to be responsible for someone else's financial obligation if they default. To, if I'm going to be surety for someone, I am obligating myself that if this person doesn't pay, then I'll take care of it. I'll do that. In other words, perhaps someone's financial situation is not good, and the other person's is. Otherwise, they wouldn't need you to do this. Right? That makes sense. You don't need someone to be surety if you can take care of it yourself. Obviously, you can't. And so you, the one whose financial situation is good, you become the guarantor or the backer or the security for whatever it is that that person's going to owe to another person. 
Now, the most familiar way to be surety for someone is when we use the phrase cosign, right? It is when you cosign for a loan. Maybe someone asks you, hey, could you cosign for my car? I'm buying a new car. Would you be the cosigner? Sometimes they say, would you co-sign for a mortgage? Uh, that's uh, some things that happen as well. And so what that means, if you decide to be surety for that person, if they default, you pay. You pay. Okay, that's the way it goes. Now, mind you, we're not talking tonight. Please make this distinction. We're not talking about lending someone money for something. That's another subject. For some say, hey, you know what? You need money, you want to buy it? Okay, I'll lend you the money. That's another proverb subject. We're not even talking about giving money to someone. You could do that too if you want. I mean, you could lend, you can give. Uh, in other words, you say, well, you know what? So you want to buy this? Tell you what, I'll just buy it for you. And you say, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. We're not talking about those two things. Again, those are other things we'll deal with. We're talking about you telling a lender if this person uh, doesn't honor to pay what they said they'll pay, they default for whatever reason, that I'm going to go ahead and pay back what they promised to pay back. You're making sure the payment. You're making certain the payment. You're making sure it gets paid. It's called surety. It's called surety ship. So we clear that's the definition. That's what we're talking about. Not talking about lending someone money. Not talking about giving somebody money. We're talking about becoming surety for a person. That's the definition. So number one, we see the uh, definition of surety ship. Number two, would you write this down? Get the meat of it here now. Let's talk about the dangers of surety ship. So I guess the question is, okay, preacher, I get it. Surety ship is when someone, might, maybe a son or a daughter or a brother or a sister or a parent says, hey, you know what, uh, could you do me a favor? Uh, I want to get this X, Y, Z, and uh, the bank's not giving me any money. They won't loan it to me. Uh, and, and so could you, could you, could you co-sign for this? Listen, you don't have to pay. I'll pay it. I'll take care of it. All you got to do is sign your name. Don't worry. Everything will be fine. And you have to decide, hmm. Do I do it or do I not? Well, I love them. We'll get to that later. <laughs> I love them. And boy, I want things better for my kids and myself. And you know, they're young and you know, they need help. And you struggle with that, don't you? You say, do I do it or do I not do it? What do I do? They may even throw the fact, well, you're a Christian, aren't you? And Christians are supposed to give and help people, right? They may do that for you. And you scratch your head and say, what do I do? Is this something, not according to men's opinion, according to the Bible, that I should do? Is it something that God wants me to do? Amen. Let me throw this in here. I think it's a good place to put it. There is one place in the Bible that speaks of suretyship in a positive way. And that is when it speaks of, watch this, don't miss it. What the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. did for us. He was our surety. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 7.22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. In other words, watch this. He paid our debt on the cross of Calvary. He made certain to God the Father that your debt and my debt was paid by going to the cross of Calvary and shedding his blood for our sins to pay it in full. Praise God for that. Amen. He became surety for us. I thank God for that. Because he paid, guess what? I was bankrupt when it came to salvation. Amen. I didn't have nothing, you know. I wanted, to, I wanted to go to heaven and all that, but I couldn't pay it on my own. I needed somebody to save me, and the Lord Jesus Christ became my surety. Praise the Lord. But that's the only place that speaks of it positive. You know, in all the other verses that deals with it in the same word, the same word, financially, the Bible has nothing good to say about financial suretyship. Nothing. It's all negative. We're going to look at Proverbs 6, 1 through 5 in a moment here, but let me read a few of them for you. You'll hear these a few times in the next probably half hour. All right, 20 minutes. Anyway, <laughs> Proverbs eleven fifteen. He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it, and he that hateth suretyship is sure. Amen. Did you get that? Amen. 
He's saying, uh, if, you, if, you, if you are surety for someone, you're going to learn a lesson. Right. A hard lesson. But if you hate it, you're, you, you get it. Right. If you hate surety shit. That's pretty obvious if you ask me Amen. what God says about it. Proverbs 17 and verse 18. A man void of understanding striketh hands and becometh surety in the presence of his friend. Oh, yes, I'll take care of that. No, you have no problem. If you don't take I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> That's stupid. That's dumb. And God says that people that are uh, become surety for another, he says you're void of understanding. Proverbs 22, 26. Be not thou one of them that strike hands or of them that are sureties for debts. That sounds pretty plain if you ask me. He says, don't be one of those people that exercises surety. Not talking about giving money, not talking about lending money, talking about being surety. Again, it's different. Why would God say that this is not something we ought to do? Now, first of all, we don't need a why. Right? Amen. If God says don't do it, we don't do it, right? right. We, we don't need, well, well, tell me why. Then I'll, then I'll decide whether I want to do it or not. We don't need that. Amen. But when we have it, it, it does help a little bit, right? It, it helps us understand it. So why would God say it's not something good for us to do? Well, let's consider two things about, oh, by the way, you don't have it back on this, do you? You think I'm going to preach shorter tonight, don't you? Well, maybe I will. But anyway, it's just a shorter outline. But anyway, consider first of all, letter A, write this down. As, you're, as someone's saying, saying to you, would you please co-sign for this car? Would you please co-sign for this house? You have to think of some things. Here's the first one. Consider first of all, the reasons that they need surety ship. Amen. Why do they need it? Do you know that financial service companies, by the way, most of them are based in Wilmington. Just go up to Chase and Citibank and the high rises. Boy, boy, how'd they get the money to build those? You. Me. Financial service companies, watch this, spend about $17 billion a year marketing their products. Offering to people credit cards, personal loans, home equity loans, refinances, reverse mortgages, all of those things. By the way, $83 million a year is spent on promoting student credit card use. They want you to get in there early borrowing money. They, watch this, they want to lend people money. They want to. That is their business. That's how they make their money. They make their money off lending people money. They look for ways that they can lend people money. If there is a way to lend you money, they will do it. They will. So then, why then would someone need someone to co-sign for something they want to buy? Co-sign for a car, or a boat, or an ATV, or a house, or, 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 or on a credit card. Here's why. Because the lender who is striving to lend you money is refusing to give them money. Why is that? If they want to do it, why don't they? Well, it's not hard to figure out. You see, the number one reason that people need a cosigner is because they have bad credit. That's why. That's why I don't get, that's why I don't get alone. Because they have bad credit. If you don't pay your bills on time, if you overspend your income, if you uh, are too far in debt, if you have poor money management or you have a bad work history to the lender you, that wants to lend it to you and trying to find a way, to them, you are a bad risk. Right. You're a bad risk. And then so they'll say, well, if you want to get it, then you're going to have to get yourself a cosigner. Why is that? Because they want to make sure they get their money back. Right. They want to make sure. And they want to hang it on somebody's neck that can pay. So again, if the bank doesn't think that, that the person's going to pay them back, watch this, then why do you as a cosigner think they will? 
says, if anyone doesn't know, we're not touching them with a 10-foot pole. Why are you saying, well, I don't see the big deal. There's a problem. Right. Something is wrong. Again, Proverbs 22, 26. Be not thou one of them that strike hands or of them that are sureties for debt. God says, don't do it. But they, but they're, they're, they just they have some they need they, no don't do it that's what the Bible says sorry don't co-sign for it consider the reason that they need suretyship that's what you should do first Amen. well then secondly also consider this consider the result of suretyship the result. Now, when you are tempted to co-sign for someone, ask yourself this question, if you would. Am I really helping them? Amen. 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 Now, some may call this tough love, but it's really Bible love. That's what it is. Am I you see, most of the time, the very reason that they need a co-signer is because somewhere in their life there's a problem. Right. There's a problem. Either there, uh, uh, I'll just say, either there's a problem in their character, or there's a lack of discipline somewhere, or they're not living by Bible principles. Right. They may have bad financial habits. They may want to, things that they cannot afford. Right. They may have a spending problem, overspending. It's like a drug. They're like a junkie with, uh, with Amazon and uh, all these other places. I, I just need to buy something today to make me feel better. You're like a junkie. If you can't afford it, it's not good. Maybe they don't know how to budget or they've never functioned with a budget. And they just say, well, the money's in the account. I guess I'll spend it. Not thinking of, well, well there's, a, there's a mortgage payment coming up next week. You might want to think about that. Or maybe they just don't want to work. And that's the problem. My point is this. Again, most of the time, the very reason somebody needs a cosigner, there is a character problem somewhere. Amen. Could be impatience, by the way. You name it. But please listen to this. The problem that they have can only be solved by a change in their behavior, right. not by getting a cosigner. Right. Getting a cosigner will not help their problem. Right. It, co it won't fix their bad financial habits. It won't, all of a sudden, now they want to budget. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, they'll stop spending uh, uh, as much as they do. Uh, again, the problem will not be changed by getting a cosigner. The problem is they have to change their spending habits or their behavior. Amen. And by the way, if you cosign for somebody like that, you're just hanging yourself. Right. You are. You really are. Well, they're my child and I love them. You don't love them. You're missing it. Again, getting a cosign will not fix the problem. There must be a change in their actions with and their attitudes towards work and their finances. You may say, wait, 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 wait a minute, preacher. Wait a minute, preacher. You must not live in a real world. Okay, because... Someone has to co-sign for me because I have to establish credit. I got to establish my credit. That's not true. Right. You've fallen for the culture. It's not true. Do you know it is possible? It really is. It's possible for you to save money and pay cash for the item. Revelation. You can pay cash. Pay for it. You want it? Buy it. There it is. And pay pay cash for a car? Yeah. You know what the what car I want. Maybe you want the wrong car for your wallet. Maybe you should bring your expectations down a little bit. Uh, pay cash. Well, I want an ATV. I want a boat. I want, a, I, I, want, I want this gun and I need this jewelry and I want these clothes. I mean, we want to take a vacation every year. And how about the wedding that's coming up? Uh, pay cash. Right. Amen. Save up and pay cash. Right. Uh, stop borrowing money for everything under the sun. That's the cultural way of doing things. Right. And many of God's people have fallen for it. So, oh, I'm preacher. 
Got you here. What about a mortgage? What are you going to say about that? Are you telling me to pay cash for a house? If you can, why not? Why not? Right. Buy a small one. Right. Buy a fixer-upper. And, and pay cash for it. And save up for a bigger one. And then flip it. And then get a bigger one and so forth. If not, and, and by the way, there are mortgage companies that will grant you a mortgage based on your income and your job history if you saved a nice down payment without having a credit score. There are mortgage companies out there that do that. Right. And then you won't need a co-signer. So all your excuses are out the window. Right. They're gone. You don't need a cosigner. Now back on the other side of the cosigner, here, here, here's the problem. Because sometimes you say, well, a preacher, uh, you know, it's my child, it's my, it's my sister, it's my aunt, and this and that. Here, 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 here I'm going to kind of broaden the application of this here. Most people have a poor understanding of what it means to help someone. Most people do. When you give money to somebody that's standing on the side of the road, <laughs> holding a cardboard sign, asking people for money, and you look, and he's looking at you, and you kind of, you're, you're hoping that red light changes fast. <laughs> and it ain't changing fast. And you're like, ah, oh, he's looking at me, what do I do? And he starts kind of walking towards your car, and you go, okay. Well, you don't do that anymore. I try to get the mud. Okay. Uh, and you think, I helped them. You didn't help them. As a matter of fact, you hurt them. You hurt them. Hey, hey, here's an idea. How about rolling your window down and saying this? Excuse me, can I ask you a question? Why do you need money? Why do you need money? Why aren't you working? That's what everybody else is doing. Amen. You're standing there with a sign. Go grab a Verizon sign, a progressive sign, whatever it is. Grab it. And, and they, they pay for that stuff. You can do the same thing you're doing now and work like everybody else does. Amen. By the way, that's God's plan for us. Amen. If we want money, guess what? We work. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 For even when we were with you, this commanded, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Amen. Well, preacher, what about those people? Listen, with businesses begging people to work, yeah. I mean, begging, I can't believe what they're offering people to, to work. Bonuses and uh, all this stuff. And I'm thinking, go get a job. Amen. Help America. Help the economy. Do what's right. Do what God says. Amen. Get to work. Right. That's what I want to say. And besides that, all the government programs that are offered to help people that have real needs, and not so real needs sometimes, why are you asking people for money? That's what I want to say. You see, it's the same with a loved one or a friend. Here's what I mean. If they have a spending problem, if they have money management problems, if they are behind on their bills, but boy, they're out there buying a pack of cigarettes every day. Uh, if they are not paying and can't pay or are just barely paying what they already owe to people, why in the world would we, you, co-sign anything for them? It doesn't make sense. Right. You're not helping them. Amen. You know, we get at the church, people come in, and they want money all the time. They do. They call the church just about every week. Can, can you pay my electric bill? They don't like when I ask things like this, or the guys ask things like this. Why do you need money? Yes. Let's see what you're bringing in. Let's see what's going out. Let's sit down. Let's make a budget, a plan. Because with all the government... Pro Listen, we live in America. I mean, we help people that need help. And for someone to squander it and then go to you and say, hey, could you help by co-signing this thing? Are you crazy? Right. Have we lost our mind? Yeah. It's like throwing gasoline on a fire. Uh, we're not helping them. We have to get to the root of the problem and say, let's fix this money management problem that you have or this spending problem that you have or whatever it is because you need to change your behavior. Otherwise, I might as well just take that money and throw it into the fire. Right. 
Because in another month or so, you're going to come back asking for more. Right. You have to change your behavior. You're not only not helping them, you're also hurting yourself if you co-sign something. Because you're the, going to be the one holding the bag. Right. You are. And they're going to just step off. And that creditor's going to be calling your phone number, asking you for that money that you promised you'd give them if they defaulted. They're not going to be chasing them anymore because they know that that's, that rock has been wrung, or that, that sponge has been wrung dry a long time ago. They're going to come after you and hound you until you pay what they owe. It's a bad deal Amen. to cosign. So we see the definition of suretyship. We see the danger of suretyship. And then lastly, we see the departure from suretyship. All right, let's go back to our text. He thought we'd never get there. Let's go back. To, notice, my son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, watch what he says here, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of thy friend, go humble thyself and make sure thy friend give not sleep to thine eyes nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Now here's what he's saying here. If you are now, maybe you entered into a cosign situation now. Listen, it happens. We've done things like that. Maybe right now you've co-signed. If you are in a surety ship situation now, if you have already promised, promised it to someone and agreed to co-sign, and you've done it already, guess what? You're stuck. Amen. You're in it. Lesson time. Honor what you promised and pray that that person pays his bill. Because if not, they're coming after you. But what he's saying here is this. If there is any way that you can get out of this situation, you say, how so? Well, how about this? Wait until they make some payments and try to get them to refinance in their name only as soon as you can. Just say, let's try to refinance. Let's just try. Let's just go. Then if you can do that, get out of it as soon as possible. And when you do, do not do it again because you're not helping anyone. It's kind of like that person that um, is addicted to drugs, you know, and they need money, they need money, they need money. They, and you keep feeding them money because you feel sorry for them. You're not helping them. I know it's hard, especially when it's a loved one, to have to stand back and turn them over to God and say, Lord, I, I, no, you're going to have to deal with them, Lord. I, I, I'm not going to be the one that's responsible for their drugs and cigarettes and all that killing them. I'm not going to do that. Right. And it's hard. It is. Amen. But it's right. Amen. It's right. And understand something, entering into any kind of that such agreement of suretyship has the potential of causing you problems personally with that person. Oh, the relationships that are messed up when, they, when they're not paying or they're paying late and you're getting the calls or the emails that are saying, another late payment, we're going to dock it from your, your, uh, your account then. And the strain personally it can cause. And then the financial problems, uh, uh, the, the, the habits that ruin them, you have been brought into their situation and they could ruin you as well. Because you're responsible. I've known people that have, have, have co-signed for people and they went to buy something themselves, maybe a vacation home or something, and they were denied because they were accounted for what that person was doing. It's going to hurt you. Again, the third time, if you want to give someone money to help them, go ahead and do it. If you want to loan someone money, go ahead and do it. That's a different subject later in Proverbs. But the Bible is quite clear. He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it, and he that hateth suretyship is sure. A man void of understanding striketh hand and becometh surety in the presence of his friend. God says you don't get it if you're doing that. You're missing it. You're not helping anyone. We need to be teaching financial principles to ourselves and also our children, Amen. because there's wisdom in it. Praise there's the wisdom Lord. in it. Is it easy to do? Not always. But is it the right thing to do, and the best thing to do? Always. Amen. Because it comes from God's Word. Listen, 
Let's not be like Congress, spending and handling money irresponsibly. Right. Let's honor God and his word Amen. and his principles on suretyship. Let's pray.